You don't want to count calories, you don't want to hop on a specialized diet like low carb, but you do want to lose weight. Maybe even see if you can improve your blood sugar, insulin, cholesterol, and blood pressure. So you look into intermittent fasting. In this content, that's exactly what we'll be getting into. Does intermittent fasting change any of those outcomes? This study I'll be presenting for you will help us understand. Let's dive in. Learn your body, a science-based education. So while we're going to be discussing intermittent fasting and its effect in weight loss, cholesterol, blood pressure, and all the other measures we discussed at the beginning, this research, which is linked for you along with my detailed notes and possible future amendments, was done on overweight middle-aged men and women. So if you aren't middle-aged, overweight, or you're an alien, <laughs> there may be some differences in result. But don't worry, I'll have information for you too at the end. If you do fit the characterization, then this study will offer some real insight. So how did the researchers go about probing this topic? The researchers recruited 116 individuals to partake in the study. They made sure all the participants fit the same criteria. Overweight, middle-aged, but could be both men and women. Then they instructed these individuals to weigh themselves in the morning prior to eating and drinking anything. And then the weight was uploaded to an app the researchers could use. Then they instructed about half of the participants to follow a time-restricted eating pattern, which is another way of saying intermittent fasting. 16 hours of fasting, 8 hours of eating. They ate from 12 until 8 p.m. The other group was put in a continuous meal timing group, which consumed three square meals across the day and were allowed to snack between meals if they chose. However, no other nutritional instructions were given, so neither group was placed on a special diet. Final point on the study design, the data was collected from not quite equal number of both sexes, women making up 40% of each group, continuous or time restricted. So a slight skew towards men, but comparisons between the groups continuous versus time restricted were equal. So we'll be looking at data that is pre-nutrition intervention versus post-nutrition intervention, which is 12 weeks later as well as data comparing the overall change from the continuous traditional diet versus the time-restricted intermittent fasting diet. So let's look at that now. Okay, here we're looking at the data for body weight and we can ask ourselves, was there a change? We compare the pre-intervention, which is before the diet started, to the post-intervention after 12 weeks of each diet. Now, granted, the continuous diet group isn't changing their diet much because they're moving from a traditional diet style, three square meals, to three square meals. And the statistics actually show that there is almost a significant difference between the pre versus post. I'll address that in a minute. Let's do the same thing and look at the intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating group, going from their traditional diet to only eating at 12 p.m. until 8 p.m. with no other changes. Here we see there is a difference, a decrease in body weight. This makes sense because there is an expected change in habit, switching to a time-restricted schedule of eating, eliminating breakfast. However, as mentioned prior, the continuous diet almost showed a statistical difference as well. That may be due to these individuals being faced with their weight every day, deciding to change their habits, therefore eating less even if the timing of eating didn't change. Just one possibility of several, surely. Now, comparing both diets against each other, there's no difference, meaning although the time-restricted eating group did lose weight, the overall weight loss wasn't great enough to be detected when comparing against the continuous eating group. So does that mean the intermittent fasting time-restricted eating group didn't lose weight? No, it doesn't. And here's further evidence. While I did tell you the researchers recruited 116 individuals, they also recruited a subsample of 46 individuals that actually drove to the laboratory to be tested more rigorously. These individuals under more rigorous testing also had their body weight measured along with other measures we'll discuss shortly. And? Well, the researchers discovered a stronger result. The lack of weight loss in the continuous diet group persisted and the time-restricted eating group's weight loss also persisted. But the difference between the two was also more noticeable, almost statistically significant. Now, a question that might pop up is, where did the weight come from? 
To answer that, the researchers looked at body fat and lean mass, or non-fat mass, and they found that neither group lost substantial body fat. Yet the time-restricted group did lose lean mass, according to multiple measures. That then raises the question, was this lean mass muscle? To test this, they measured muscle size along with strength and found no changes in either for either group. So why might there be a decline in lean mass with no decrease in muscle size and strength? If we have to take a stab at answering that, we might be able to explain it by blaming glycogen content within the organs, like the liver and even possibly the muscles, which is a stored carbohydrate that often is used quickly when weight loss is in the works. However, that's purely educated guesswork, so there's no data to substantiate directly. Okay, we'll recap later again, but let's move on to metabolism because that's where we're gonna get some interesting results here. In measures of resting metabolism, where the participants aren't moving, taking away most, if not all, of the movement-based energy expenditure, the researchers found no decreases in metabolism. However, when measuring total metabolism, both groups experienced a reduction in metabolism. So resting metabolism, no change, total metabolism, decrease. So the researchers do mention that there's an accompanying decrease in movement, step count, which could explain the reductions in total metabolism, which is made up of the, in this case, non-changing resting metabolism, along with physical activity or movement based on energy use, which was apparently reduced. Again, with weight loss, this is common. Generally, the brain, along with particular hormones, reduce the drive to move. Finally, cardiovascular and diabetes related metrics. How did the cholesterol and blood pressure and blood sugar and all that fare? Well, blood sugar, insulin, and insulin sensitivity did not change for either group. So time-restricted eating did not change any of these outcomes. And the same was seen for cholesterol of all major types, HDL and LDL particles, as well as blood fats, triglycerides. Interestingly, however, blood pressure decreased in both groups, one with systolic and one with diastolic. I don't find these results altogether too surprising since the participants lost a tiny amount of weight, but it does show that 12 weeks of intermittent fasting with little to no weight loss does not change many health metrics. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, what does this all mean? What conclusions can we make off of this information? Well, this means that intermittent fasting in this study named time-restricted eating without actively counting calories or any other nutritional intervention can encourage very mild weight loss, but that weight loss is primarily non-fat. Interestingly, it also reduces total metabolism, likely through discouraging movement that expends energy yet has no effect when looking at cholesterol, blood sugar, or insulin, and may slightly reduce blood pressure. Now, as I mentioned, this is applicable to overweight, middle-aged people, and this may yet be true for other individuals as well, but if you'd like more studies to back a more definitive conclusion, I'd recommend checking out the final verdict content if it's up already or check out the series where I dissect more studies for specific populations and try to find one that fits for you. All of that is linked for you, and with that, I bid you adieu, and I'll hope to speak with you in the next one. Bye.